Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming for this session on a Sunday morning. Uh, this is a special session organized uh, to bring into uh, light some as aspects related to the bigger topic of beauty, art, aesthetics, and human development from the point of view of Sri Aurobindo's and the mother's vision on uh, some of these areas. And um, we have a very distinguished and a very eclectic panel of speakers here who bring different, a very diverse background. So there will be different aspects related to this larger theme of beauty, aesthetic development, and human development that we will hopefully get to hear this morning. Um, you know, I had prepared long remarks on these, but uh, I would rather that we listen to what our panelists have to say. Uh, I'll just briefly say that uh, Mother and Sri Aurobindo um, very much emphasized the idea of um, you know, as part of the integral development of the individual, what role aesthetic development, the development of a sense of beauty, what part it should play in the overall development of the individual, and also the in development of the collective. Sri Aurobindo wrote essays on the national value of art. He titled them as that, national value of art. So certainly, art and aesthetic development play a part in the the life of the nation, life of the society as well. So uh, with just that brief uh, comment, highlighting the significance of this session, um, I would like to introduce our speakers now. We would begin with our uh, first speaker for the session, Manoj Pavitran, who comes to us from Oroville. Uh, Manoj has a background in engineering, also um, then he went to study design at National Institute of Design, Ahmedabad, and somewhere in between that he was also uh, interested in yoga, Sri Aurobindo's transformational yoga, and uh, found himself in Oroville, where now he is um, heading a very interesting project called Swadharma which is a program directed for the youth who are on this journey of self-discovery. Um, so it's a program geared for youth from age 18 to 28. And for that, he brings in his background of uh, design, uh, which he thinks is also, uh, he feels is also something that has helped him find solutions to many of the problems, not just in an individual life, but in professional life, and his yoga, his sadhana as well. So how he integrates all that as part of the human development, we'll open our session. If Manoj would share uh, maybe for the next 10 minutes or so, some thoughts on that, and then we'll move on to next speakers in the panel. So um, welcome, Manoj. Thank you. <clears throat> I would like to recall two chapters from The Life Divine where Sri Aurobindo is reviewing entire spectrum of human thought and various philosophies looking at human existence and its purpose. He writes two chapters called Delight, the Problem, and Delight, the Solution. The ancient Upanishadic realization that everything is born out of delight, sustained by delight, and returns to delight. That insight as the very fundamental nature of existence and the process of life, if we hold that picture in mind, that will give us the clue to and look at what do we mean by human development. Is it 
a process of returning to delight. If we are able to return to delight, are we able to hold it within us? Do we have the capacity to experience and hold delight? I would like to hold that as the reference for human development and in that context comes art, beauty and aesthetic sense. Art as activity that creates forms that are beautiful and aesthetic sense as a faculty that opens us to enter and access delight. So art come in as a direct doorway to that which is very fundamental to existence. And here comes the development of faculties. Do we have the capacity to perceive First of all, there may be a beautiful rainbow out there, but if the faculty of seeing is not there, can we experience that delight? We cannot. Even if we have our eyes open, if the aesthetic sense is not developed, can we experience it? We cannot. So there comes the whole range of, we can say, education. Education for the soul that enable us to first of all perceive what is there. And then to bring out and express. In that context, Sri Aurobindo refers to the function of art having threefold stages. First being purely the aesthetic delight, the perfection of form, whether it is physical or intellectual or emotional, any form having the pure perfection that reveals the beauty. That's like the first stage of art. If we can create beauty that gives us the sense, the experience of aesthetic delight, then comes the next stage without losing that profound sense of beauty, experience of beauty and the delight. Can we bring in the profound depths of ideas into it? The truth conceptions that find expression in the forms through which we express ourselves. Like when Einstein came up with the relativity, that was a wonderful, beautiful idea. Science created a formula. But Dali takes up that notion and when he paints a melting clock, suddenly the notion of time is captured by an artist in a way that is different than what it was perceived before. before. And that melting clock became an icon, one of the most remembered symbol created by an artist to represent a complex idea. But that is only a second stage of art. Third stage is where artist is able to invoke a presence not only aesthetic delight, but 
truth conception of great ideas along with it a living presence that ancient sthapatis knew ancient artists knew and every artist had their creative process that first of all involved in working the presence that is to find expression through their creative art and that when it spreads across a culture when that refines a culture the artifacts the daily living habits the rituals the forms there the present spreads through the culture and we had in this country that conscious presence that was invoked an art that was always turned towards the divine in every detail not only the beauty the conception but also the presence and as individuals we learn to invoke that presence and bring beauty into life the whole culture acquires that fragrance so the nation soul begins to express itself through that collective vessel here art become the direct doorway to access not only the delight but also the presence and profound ideas so i would like to just leave it at that as a perspective and leave give space for others and i think um, you left it at a very um important point because i think this really leads us into our next uh, um speaker for the day for this panel preeti di preeti ghosh uh, she is sitting right there um she's a very long long time resident of uh, the ashram here sri aurobindo ashram uh, she came here as a child I, if i uh, have read <laughs> understood correctly and she um, grew up as an artist here in the ashram itself and she was uh, given some guidance by the mother as well who was an accomplished artist um and she received her blessings and to awaken the artist within her the inner artist uh, some of you probably have seen some of her works here in the ashram dining room and other places um so we are really happy that she agreed to uh, spend some time here and be a part of this panel and uh, she had requested that since her mode of expression is through her paintings through her work through her art um so instead of giving a like a lecture or a talk she would be most comfortable if we if i ask pose her some questions and we wanted to do a little slide show of her paintings as well but uh, this being sunday there were some technical things we couldn't get the projector in place but uh, those of you who are interested we can certainly uh, we have them here on the computer so maybe we'll get a chance to talk about some of her inner motivation for few of her works as well but uh, preeti di if uh, shruti can you just check if that mic is working for her yeah so um, welcome preeti di thank you okay um i'll thank you Excellent, and I think the three um, purposes or stages, uh, or the three roles that art can play that you describe, really lead us into what some of my questions are for Preeti Di. Uh, can you describe for us a little bit about your inner motivation as an artist and how art, your painting, how your art has become a means of your inner journey, of your inner. sadhana like what manoj was saying you know the art 
has always been the highest purpose of the art has been to invoke that living presence. Uh, so what has been your experience as an artist in terms of how art can become a means of inner journey? Uh, when I started my painting, uh, it wasn't a Kedia, it was just, uh, you know, we were brought up in this uh, institution and uh, mother uh, had arranged our timetable in such a way that uh, we were just allotted one period on Saturday and the last period for painting or drawing. So that left very scanty time for uh, developing your, uh, you know, if you had painting, any knack in painting or drawing. Then as the years passed and I grew into, into an adolescent and mother was always there, so we used to paint or draw something and give it to her and she, for everyone, she would be in ecstasy. So oh, you've painted this, you've done it for me. And uh, so gradually I, as I got interested uh, as to take her paintings personally and then she used to give her comments. And I remember the first paintings that uh, I had drawn were from photographs. And she wasn't very happy. And then she used to always insist that you try to paint something which comes from within. Now, you've painted a landscape which is taken from a calendar, but it's so very dead and dull. Then when I started to uh, go more, uh, you know, more uh, trying to paint something of my own experiences, uh, she would come out with very subtle suggestions and uh, she would insist that uh, you should try to paint something which is uh, not very artificial, but something which goes with your experience. I remember I had painted uh, a few figures, old and uh, old ladies, children, who were marching towards, uh, towards a goal. And I'd left, it was through a cave, and there was, uh, mm, uh, the cave looked more like the, you know, the, uh, an opening, but uh, she said it looked more like a figure. Then she suggested, why don't you paint, uh, say, rays of light coming out from that mouth? So then I did it, and for most of the paintings, they were more, more than naturalistic. It was more, you know, after I'd read something from Shobindo, from Sabitri, or uh, music, Sunil Das music. They inspired me a lot. In fact, you had a painting here, no? The Dancing Girls? Yes, yes, yes. That I remember, uh, Mother had said it was a difficult year for us. It was, I think, in 19... This is the one, right? No, no, no. Oh, this oh there, right. there. So... It had been a difficult year for the ashram, and uh, so Sunilda tried to portray that. The, normally his music, New Year music, lasted for uh, 20 minutes or so. And uh, the first part was a little uh, dragging and slow. And the last uh, 10 minutes or so, the whole thing picked up. And there was such an exuberance of joy. I said, let me see if I can uh, portray that on the canvas. And uh, after a few attempts, I think I got what I wanted, you know, that joy. The figures dancing, coming dancing from, from the upper regions and they were bathed in this uh, white light. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, you can't hear? And uh, 
Well, it was appreciated and they said, this is your masterpiece. I said, I don't know. Then there was, uh, there were most of the figures were centered around mother. Uh, the mother is, uh, uh, she is, uh, her relation with her a devotee, like a daughter, or uh, a mother, she is, uh, there was the supramental descent, and then she had this experience of this uh, massive golden doors, and she was standing in front of them, and she had a huge hammer, golden hammer in her hand, and then she said, the time has come, and holding the hammer with both hands, she gave a blow to that door and then the golden light came pouring. And that I tried and then uh, I think that's yes, right yes, here. Yes, that's, that's, that's it, this one, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the same theme I tried that uh, mother standing in front of the doors, there were seven of them yes. without my calculation. That is one of my favorite, um, I mean I like this is, right? Yes, yes. So, uh, mostly my figures were centered around mother. And for every one of these paintings, I really had to, how should I say, meditate for days together. I tried so many, uh, how should I say, attempts, sketches. And then when I thought, you know, inwardly I was happy, satisfied, then I said, okay, I'll do it on a, you know, on the proper, um, the measurement I have, usually for my paintings, 24 by 32. And then, uh, which other painting, which was, uh, even Shobindo walking in the wilderness, golden wilderness, in all his solitude, that was also based on lines from uh, Savitri. Yes. Yes. Another favorite. Uh, which one have I? Um, then there was the one about Sri Aurobindo with children, which oh. I think that has a very <laughs> special innocence and um, you know. I, I want to be one of those children. <laughs> so if you can just speak a little bit about this one. Uh, you've all heard of Niruddha, no? Mm -hmm. So Niruddha had, uh, what is it? He had written a book on... Uh, 12 years? No, no, no. Dream dialogue. Pardon? Dream dialogue. Dream dialogue with the children. So one of my friends, she was very close to uh, to Niruddha. She said, "Why don't you make a cover for his book?" I said, "I'll try because I've never tried this theme." I did it, and then somehow uh, the whole thing got postponed, and uh, I dropped it, the whole painting. Then later on, my exhibition was coming up. I said, "Okay, let me try this one." So I painted uh, imaginary children all clustered around Shobinda and listening very intently to whatever he's recounting. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, if it's okay with you, we can come back to you with yes, more yes, questions. Sure, sure. But I think, uh, again, this is a very interesting and very relevant segue into, you know, here we have um, uh, present day uh, living master, uh, painter uh, talking about the inner dimension of creating art, the, her process of meditating and then seeing what comes from within. So for our next, uh, you know, as this kind of journey continues, I would like to invite Shruti Bidwaikar who will talk a little bit about her experience when she um, came across the works of some of the ancient masters, uh, master sculptors and um, artists who created these wonders of Indian art and heritage that we cherish. So Shruti, if you would like to take over and just come, come, come. You can just. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm grateful to the, both the speakers before me because they've made my job easy and set the tone and the mood of uh, the session. Uh, what Manojji told us is about the levels of art, how art is relevant, how we can look at art, what is its utility, what is its function from mundane to the spiritual. Preeti Di being her, herself an artist, such a beautiful expression of how, what inspired her to create such beautiful paintings. What I thought I would share with you is how I would look at art, um, because I'm also only beginning to learn painting. I have never done painting in my life, but imitation is the first way we learn, so perhaps, so that gave me a little bit of interest into how we, do we look at others' art? How do we appreciate art? And um, incidentally, I happened to have gone to uh, see the Hoysala temples in Belur and Halibut near Bangalore last year. And that was as if I would say my first encounter with the beautiful world of beauty in stone. I had seen other Mughal architecture and others, but somehow that was, uh, when I saw those, Sri Aurobindo's words were resonating in my ears. And uh, for the first time, perhaps, I did not see it as a historical work or a work of done by some king or inspired by or funded by, sponsored by, envisioned by some king. Because in history, as we were young, we were always taught the political history of a particular place, temple, kingdom, province. So we never got the insight of what the artist would have felt while making it, or how an onlooker would look at it. But these temples at uh, Belur and Halibut, very small in dimension as such, if we see as compared to Chidambaram temple or Madurai temple, they are very small as such. But the intricacies of art in granite is way more varied, way more opulent than we can find in uh, other temples, other temples in South India. I'm not comparing, but I'm just because I visited Chidambaram as well as uh, this Halibut Belu temples, and of course the Shravan Belgola huge monolithic statue of Mahabali. Uh, two, three things that came to my mind when I was looking at it. One, I remember Sri Aurobindo said that Indian art reveals itself to those who have a meditative tendency. In fact, I would like to read what Sri Aurobindo has to say and it's a very, I found it very strict guideline for us as, as such. A great oriental work of art does not easily reveal its secret to one who comes to it solely in a mood of aesthetic curiosity or with a considering critical objective mind, still less as the cultivated and interested tourist passing among strange and foreign things. But it has to be seen in loneliness, in the solitude of one's self, in moments when one is capable of long and deep meditation, and as little weighted, weighed as possible with the conventions of material life. So what we are called upon to do is to meditate in front of the stones, let the stones reveal what they want to reveal to us. And as usual, when we tour across the country, we always go with the tourist mentality and tick off saying, I have seen this place, I have seen that place. Perhaps I had gone initially with that idea that I wanted to see this. But when I, I, I was there, luckily my teacher was with me and he told me, you see, this is not just uh, one more temple you are seeing. This is what Sri Aurobindo has written about such architecture and this is what it is. And when I again came back to see, I said, thank God I was not one of another tourists there who uh, wanted to see. But I would say, I, would not, I was not perhaps open enough, was not prepared enough to sit and meditate there to see what they reveal to us. But still, uh, another thing that Sri Aurobindo, in fact, these foundations of Indian culture, those four chapters on Indian art, we get a lot of guideline on how to see, how to appreciate our architecture, sculpture, painting, 
Sri Aurobindo has dedicated each uh, part for each of these arts. Of course, uh, we can summarize the guidelines say saying that, as Manoji said, that there is a presence. So what we are looking for in a painting is a presence, which Preetidi, when she says all her paintings were centered around the mother, she had already invoked the mother, she had meditated upon the mother, and she had brought out that of herself. So uh, in, this is also because Sri says, Indian art is in fact identical in its spiritual aim and principle with the rest of Indian culture. And we know Indian culture primarily as spiritual. So Indian art also has a spiritual aim. This he wrote because we all know there were some objections raised to the fact that uh, some generalized, sweeping generalizations were made about Indian art by some British people. And uh, Sri Aurobindo said, no, you are seeing it from a wrong lenses. If you are just going to see the proportions of the body, the proportions of the head and the postures, you will not find beauty in them perhaps. You see a big pot-bellied yaksha over there or a ganpati over there, you will not appreciate. But the, the people who have carved that out of the stone, they have got some intuition. They worked on that intuition, and that is what they have carved. It is not something physically seen and drawn, a tree, beautiful tree, seen and be beautiful tree, carved or painted. It is something seen from an inner vision, inner sight. And that is what Sri Aurobindo keeps telling. He always refers to the inward eye, whether in poetry, whether in uh, art. So that was, that was something I realized that next time we see any other art, we have to inwardize, be very quiet, not be in a hurry to just finish off one temple in one day and go. That is how our tour is usually. How many days do we need to finish this city, this city? And so then I felt, no, uh, it was not the justice done to have seen that one temple, one wall, we could actually sit and meditate in that hot sun. Granite was equally hot, but it was very, very beautiful. Um, how much time do I have? Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's beautiful, I can keep on uh, uh, telling you, but uh, as I was saying, we get guidelines in Sri Aurobindo, he tells us why there was this, especially about the Mahabali statue, if I can tell you. People objected to it saying this is a huge statue, monolithic statue, it's fine, it's a monolithic statue carved up down, it is not carved down up. And uh, if you see, you can't even see the statue properly because the perspective is not given there, that much space is not given. And a lot of people objected to this pro disproportions, so to say, the shoulder is very big, the hands are disproportionately long, the, the toe, uh, one of the toe finger is very long. So uh, Sri Aurobindo says, for in, in context of another painting there, he says, and which I felt could be applied to this Mahabali statue also, there's a serenity on his face which even in the granite they have managed to bring in. The half-closed eyelids, there's that meditative poise of Mahabali which has been brought out. The unusual shoulder uh, width again shows the massiveness of his endeavor perhaps. The stature is again showing the greatness of his soul. It's not a human, uh, human carving. It's a, he was a saint. He was a th son of the first Tirtha Tirthankars. Then the disproportions perhaps have been done purposely to show him he's different from other normal human beings, which has the, the inner of that person has been represented in what we call disproportions. So these were the beautiful insights that I, uh, I felt were how Sri Aurobindo has educated. Uh, Manoji talked about the, that aesthetic education that we needed to do, we needed to get from Sri Aurobindo. Similarly with Halibut temples, this small, I'm not exaggerating, this small and apsara they have made on a uh, full pillar, small, small, small apsaras, and each apsara has equal number of ornaments from her head to the toe. All her fing finger nails are be have been made, fing uh, anklets have been made, her bangles have been made, so it's not just the big apsara, it's the smallest of the creatures, they have done that. On animals, on demons, on evils, everything they have done, that beautiful work. So this intricacy, these intricacies Sri Aurobindo has brought forth, he has, he had seen a few pictures and he 
he had an intuitive vision of all these and he gave uh, us the clue and uh, it will be really insightful for us to read something of this before we perhaps visit again i would like to read again and again before i visit any other even our mahabalipuram uh, carvings if we have to see they have a particular pattern they have a particular presence to reveal so that is all i wanted to share of my uh, experience with these things I know, um, go on and on, and I was just thinking about when I was there at Elora, oh my God, that's the experience that Elora, or any, any other places, I mean, I've been to the places that you spoke about, so thank you. And again, I think this is very good uh, segue into what we are going to hear next. Uh, we have next a couple of young uh, students who were actually also students of Manoj uh, through the Swadharma program. And they'll bring in different dimensions of art. First, we'll uh, hear from Aishwarya. Aishwarya is, um, her background involves psychology, uh, performing arts, and English literature. And um, she's studied at vol and volunteered at Auroville um, when she was also there with uh, Manoj in the Swadharma program. And she also studied something called Kolam Yoga. So it's a different dimension of art. I mean, Kolam, again, there is a whole meditative process to doing that. And she's getting ready to uh, start her master's in art as psychotherapy. So she can speak a little bit about a different dimension of art and aesthetics, both from a healing point of view and also maybe her, your experience with Kolam and what, how that helped you in your development. So welcome, Ashwarya. Thank you. Maybe 10 minutes yeah. and then. <laughs> Sorry, that's a tough job. <laughs> um, so, is it working? Okay. I recently worked on compiling a module on aesthetic sense for a website on integral education. So I'd like to begin with sharing some of my insights um, from reading what Sri Aurobindo and the mother have said about that. Um, they speak of aesthetic sense as something that's really essential to progress. And they describe it as an ability to perceive beauty even where it's not apparent. Um, this may be in works of art, in visual performing, whatever, in works of art, but it's not limited to that. We also have this experience of beauty when we um, witness an act of kindness or generosity. We feel, oh, that's so beautiful. Um, this is because there's an inherent relationship between aesthetics and ethics. Uh, they both have this capacity to create dualities like good and bad, beautiful and ugly, attractive and repulsive. And this is what we need to rise above from. Because there are also times when we experience, um, like when we witness an act of injustice or bigotry and we find that really ugly and repulsive. So what do we do then? Um, what Sri Aurobindo and the mother say is that even uh, in that ugliness, there's a hidden possibility of beauty, there's a possibility of inclusion, of acceptance, of justice, and it is that that we need to focus on and energize as opposed to uh, the hopelessness of the former perspective. Um, I think m most people here are familiar with the vocabulary of integral yoga and know of the vital being. Um, but in my own words, I think the vital being is the seat of energy and um, emotion and passion and will. But it can also be really impressionable, um, depending on the environment that it's placed in. If it's in a good environment, it is influenced by that. And if it's placed in a bad environment, it reflects that. Um, it's characterized by this polarity, and we often use the words light and shadow when we're speaking of the vital being. Uh, and we speak of shadow transformation. And I think uh, cultivating an aesthetic sense is an important step towards shadow transformation because it allows you to see the possibility of light where there is shadow. Because there can only be shadow where there is light. Is your mic on? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so this relationship between aesthetic sense and shadow transformation uh, brings me to the next segment of what I would like to share with you today. Uh, as Belu said, I'm going to be starting a master's in art psychotherapy next month. And um, 
I'm not yet a therapist, and I will be speaking more from a theoretical <laughs> perspective on this at this point. But uh, is it too loud? Should I hold it low? Yeah. It's okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, I've always been drawn to the arts. Uh, as a child, I, it was my only solace. I spent hours and hours just painting and writing and dancing by myself. Uh, growing up, then it became my only strength. And um, I would like to speak uh, a little bit about two art forms that I've received formal training in. Both are from here, from Tamil Nadu. One is Bharatnatyam and the other is Kolam. Now, both of these forms are very specific, disciplined forms of art, and many people would say that they don't have a space in art therapy because of their structured nature. But um, I think if, uh, if we look at it from a Jungian, Jungian perspective, um, they do have uh, some kind of a role, because in both of these forms we uh, try to, there's sort of an invocation of uh, gods and goddesses and other energies and like characters, and I think that these represent um, inner psychological forces, and in embodying them and in invoking them, we're uh, exploring that part of us also. And this is important because psychotherapy and healing is not always about fixing what's wrong, but also about uh, fine-tuning what is already there and coming into this wholeness. Um, there's also Freudian psychotherapy, which has a different approach. It would encourage a more uh, free self-expression. And I recently also did uh, learned another dance form. Actually, I don't know if I can call it form because it's quite a formless dance. It's called Bhutto. Um, and in that, we were f uh, very much set free from the beginning. We were told to move. Uh, we were told not to consciously like try to move, but uh, allow the movements to come to us and only move when we really needed to. Um, this was very different for me because I've always been chasing form and um, Bharatnatyam and Kolam and all these art forms sort of start up here and you know what you're supposed to make and you execute it with the body whereas this was more um, I was surprising myself constantly with my body and trying to then understand what I was doing with my mind. So there are both these movements, this upward from body to mind and mind to body, there's up and down. And we know of this also in integral yoga. And I don't think that they're um, mutually exclusive and I don't think that they can be treated separately. I think that there needs to be some kind of meeting of both of these uh, forms of thinking of psychotherapy. Um, but there are four sort of aspects of art psychotherapy that I think set art psychotherapy apart from conventional psychotherapy that I would like to share with you. Uh, these are absorption, agency, catharsis and containment. Um, absorption refers to this feeling of being completely absorbed in what you're doing, feeling completely present, like a child who's playing, who's not self-conscious. And this presence is really important for healing. Um, agency refers to this feeling of responsibility for one's own healing, which is uh, a specialty of art therapy because um, the client quite literally takes healing into their own hands when they come into an art therapy session. And a lot of mental health issues uh, have, um, have this side effect of a feeling of loss of control. So in this space, in the therapeutic space, the client can really feel like they're in control of their healing and they feel independent of the therapist because the therapist is just there sort of guiding their expression. Um, and then there's catharsis, which is the emotional release that one experiences when we symbolically express ourselves or even if you like we witness a symbolic uh, expression of something that we're holding inside of us. Uh, and then there's containment. The artwork itself becomes sort of a container for all the unacceptable, intolerable, ugly feelings. It becomes a record for the therapeutic process and it can be something that you either keep with you as a reminder or it can be something you um, burn or offer symbolically. So this brings me back to the mother and Sri Aurobindo and what they've said about perfection. Um, 
their idea of perfection is very different from the conventional idea of perfection as an absence of all things bad and wrong and ugly. They see it more as um, an absence of nothing, which I find so simple and so beautiful. It's this feeling of uh, wholeness, which comes from a very deep self-awareness and self-acceptance also, I think. And that can be, again, aided by the cultivation of an aesthetic sense. So. I would like to draw to a close with some suggestions from the mother on how to cultivate an aesthetic sense with children. Um, so she says that when a child experiences ugliness or disharmony, uh, say in their bodies and they come up to you and they say, my arms are too fat, my face is too big, something like this, uh, you can help them change their narrative and instead say uh, that my arms will be harmonious, my face will be harmonious. What this does is it replaces that feeling of dejection that they came to you with, with more a feeling of possibility and also responsibility because you're not encouraging them to, uh, you're not encouraging also frivolous self-acceptance. Um, another suggestion from her is that when a child is drawing something they've seen or experienced, it's not advisable to uh, insist on technique or details. At least at first, it's more important for them to just draw their impression of um, the experience that they had because this helps them build their relationship with beauty. And should they want to become artists later, they'll work on, they would want to work on technique and all of this anyway. Um, but it's more important for them to have an authentic relationship with beauty first. And this is not just for children. She says that beauty is something that we must all incorporate into our daily life. And um, so I would like to end with something that she said that I don't have written down here. So I'm just going to share my impression of it with you. Um, she says, let beauty be your constant ideal. Beauty of soul, beauty of sentiment, beauty of work, thought, action. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I would like to end with that. Thank you. Thank you. And um, this again just really fits in wonderful, uh, wonderfully with what we will be hopefully hearing next from Siddharth. Uh, Siddharth is also uh, part of the Swadharma team with Manoj. And he's also trained as an engineer, worked for a year or so, and felt that even though everything seemed right, but something was not right, or maybe nothing was right, and that journey led him to Auroville and to Swadharma, and now he works um, there as part of the team of uh, team at Swadharma on using design, technology, and uh, an integral education. He also worked on that module on beauty, if I remember correctly. And Siddharth said he would like to speak a little bit about art, beauty as lifestyle. Like Ashwarya was talking about the wholeness, how art and aesthetic sense can bring us to that sense of wholeness. So what does that mean in terms of, I mean, the, when he said that phrase, art as lifestyle uh, or beauty as lifestyle. So I'm curious to know more about how Siddharth, you would speak on that a little bit. And so 10 minutes and then we'll maybe uh, have more questions and interactions. Thanks, Belu. Am I too loud? No. Am I audible without the mic? Okay. Um, okay, so I'll be sharing my story briefly today about my journey into exploration of beauty. And uh, I'd like to start with asking a question uh, that how many of you in the audience here feel you are artists of, you could be any kind of artist and need not be a professional artist? Can you please raise your hands? Sorry? Yeah, I'm asking to for the people who feel they are artists of any kind, they could be artists of any kind, to raise their hands. Do you feel you are an artist? Are you an artist? Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Right. Right. 
and I am not to find out that capacity to bring the bring the capital. So there's at least quite a few of you who didn't raise their hands. And uh, I'd like to look into this. What is it that makes people feel that they're not artistic? So what is it that separates an artist from a non-artist? Uh, and loosely referencing the mother here, she said, an artist is someone who, who expresses uh, who sees beauty and art is art is an expression of something beautiful now this something beautiful could be expressed as a thought or a beautiful composition or a beautiful movement but the forms of this expression need not necessarily be limited to these conventional art forms Basically, the expression of something beautiful is art. And beauty can just as well be expressed through a beautiful glance, or a beautiful posture, or a beautiful silence, or just a simple reorganization of your wardrobe. This is all art. And uh, mother, in one of her interactions said um, that an artist is someone who is deeply aware of the beauty around them and someone who can see and feel things deeply that which is not obvious to the ordinary consciousness and express it and to express it needs a good instrument that is a body with good physical, vital, mental, and psychic capacities. Um, I'd like to read an excerpt from, from her interactions. If you ask me, I believe that all those who produce something artistic are artists. A word depends upon the way it is used, upon what one puts into it. One may put into it all that one wants. For instance, in Japan, there are gardeners who spend their time correcting the forms of trees so that in the landscape they make a beautiful picture. By all kinds of trimmings, props, etc., they adjust the forms of these trees. They give them special forms so that each form may be just what is needed in the landscape. A tree is planted in a garden at the spot where it is needed and moreover, it is given the form that's required for it to go well with the whole setup. And they succeed in doing wonderful things. You have but to take a photograph of the garden, a real picture, it is so good. Well, I certainly call the man an artist. One may call him a gardener, but he is an artist. All those who have a sure and developed sense of harmony in all its forms, and the harmony of forms among themselves, is necessarily an artist, whatever may be the type of their production. So that brings me to re-reflect on the question that I asked in the beginning. Do any of you who didn't raise their hands before, does it shift anything for you? Or for the ones who did, does it expand the scope of your art? Can you please raise your hands once again? Right, so at this point I can, I can share a bit about uh, my personal journey in this context. And uh, ironically, unlike all of the great people on this panel, I have never produced a piece of painting or music or danced or produced any artistic artifact. And not being able to do these things for a long time 
has served for me as a wheel to the artist in me. And I still can't do these things. But this wheel is slowly uh, unveiling itself. And gradually, I'm, I'm becoming aware of beauty around me. And a, and a simple um, seeing and expressing beauty in small, everyday things. Um, and also becoming aware of the lack of it. Just for instance, I'd like to talk about uh, during a meal, I'm aware at the po of the point at which the purpose of my eating shifts from eating to nurture the body to eating out of desire. Or talking about another instance from recently from I had an interaction with one of my colleagues and uh, we had something to disagree on and I found that my conduct of disagreement was not so graceful and the lack of this grace it stayed with me the whole day there's this gentle disharmony that I feel I'm becoming more sensitive to. And on the positive aspect, I'm, I'm, I'm able to see more of the, the deeper harmony in nature and beauty in people. And this is enabling me to connect deeply both with myself and with other people. And this process of deeply seeing and feeling things is gently bringing a sense of harmonization, a gradual purification and refining of the being. And um, I feel that be behind beauty, there is a, behind the physical sense of beauty, there is a, there's a deeper sense of harmony. And this, this harmony is the, is the very nectar of the divine delight. And we are, we are beings of delight, following from what also Manoj mentioned. And this, this delight really nurtures us. This beauty is, is very nurturing for the growth of our being. And, it, and this is something that makes the soul grow, and it's also true the other way around. If we, when, we, when we start growing from the soul dimension, we start seeking for beauty in things both inside and outside. And as we are increasingly able to access beautiful states inside, it automatically raises our awareness of sensing beauty outside. Um, and I feel by um, experiencing this beauty, um, we get a chance to enjoy the expression of divinity in the physical world, which is the world of form. So briefly summing up my thoughts here, I feel um, that there's two things to growing in beauty. Is one is seeing and the second is expressing. And, uh, and as the soul refines, more and more becomes visible. And as the instrument refines, a natural ability to express beauty develops. So I would like to close on that thought. Thanks, Pelu. Thank you. I think this was excellent, the way you summarize not just your thoughts in a way, it summarizes the whole uh, flow of thoughts that's been going on in this panel. Manoj, would you like to come here now? Because I will open it up for interactions and... Um, so. Yeah, just... Um, so we'll um, have... I have questions for all of them, but I would like to open it up for questions and interactions from the audience. 
and before we do that, should we want to add something? Uh, adding up to what uh, Siddharth just mentioned, uh, it is very interesting the way you uh, narrated your journey with how you developed, con became conscious of beauty around you and are becoming. Uh, it is, uh, I had uh, gone to teach in Surat for some time and there the students, we, we were given a topic where we had to inculcate this kind of a sensibility in the students. And it was amazing to see that uh, these 18 year children because they had everything at their hand, they could buy anything, they could order for anything. Uh, I didn't realize that they didn't have this sense of beauty in them. So we had just given an assignment because it was a part of our curriculum. We said, uh, you observe a flower and you just tell us how you feel about it. Any flower you take. Out of the 40 students in my class, 20 said okay. The remaining 20 said we can't associate with flowers, you give us something else. I said okay, a plant. 10 said, okay, a plant. Another 10 came, they said, no, even nature, plant, all this we can't associate with. This, I said, okay, sunrise, sunset, one or two accepted. Another one who was, who was really adamant on his own view, he said, there's a huge chimney that is outside my balcony and a flame is always, uh, you know, it's coming out of it and I want to observe that. I said, okay, anything that you feel beautiful, you do. And they did that assignment and it was so amazing to see everybody wrote, we never thought that a flower could give us that peace. We never thought that a sunrise, I never wanted to sit in front of that sunrise even for three minutes, but I sat for 30 minutes in front of it. And that was somewhere I still feel it was, it was a beautiful thing that how, uh, you know, that sensibility just because I was taught like that by my parents of how you observe a flower for some time or appreciate a sunrise. So this was a, a, an uh, encounter with beauty as uh, like you know you're describing. So it just reminded me of uh, this beautiful thing of how we, with little things, the everyday thing, how we associate, how we arrange the tables, how we arrange the chairs, everything we were you know telling, how you remove your chapels out, everything has to do with the lifestyle uh, beauty that Siddharth is referring to. Thank you. How many questions, thoughts? Now, after hearing Sridhar, the new uh, dimensional vista is opening. See, I did not wait, I did not do any sculpturing. But still, I can be an artist. Why, 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 that beautiful thoughts, that beautiful feelings, and even my beautiful movements. I'm consciously doing everything. I mean, he has spoken here. Yes, thank you. And uh, I think you have not brought up on that uh, yoga of Kono. Uh, I think you are not there. Um, maybe I can... Because uh, I uh, more than myself, my wife will appear. She is still in India. I was about to ask about it. You have not mentioned about yoga of Kono. Mm. So, so there is someone in Oroville? Uh, I'm here, I want to mention it. But every day I just walk on the streets when I did the Yoga of Kono. There is so much uh, the yantra aspects and uh, the so I, I just uh, it's amazing. Yeah. And how the culture has made it by really the putting the columns, how that they are imbibing that and how it uh, um, impacts on their uh, emotions and their approach to other things. I think that's a great time. Um, so there's someone in Oroville who, her name is Grace, she's the person who I learned from and um, one of the questions I get asked the most about Kolam Yoga is why is it yoga, how is this yoga? So uh, I think what she did is she's very beautifully drawn parallels between Kolam making every day and how this can be considered uh, yoga. Um, one example that I could maybe give you is that you have to make a kolam, you make a kolam every morning and no matter how beautiful it is and no matter how much hard work you put into it, tomorrow you clean it and make another one. And so this feeling of detachment from your kolam, from your creation is uh, something that makes it yog like a yogic uh, practice. That's one thing that I can say. And it's true, some days we won't feel like to uh, 
क्लियर है I feel like there's so much to say about that. I don't want to go in because it could go on forever. But um, what she's also done is she's found uh, four columns that represent the four aspects of the mother, and. I've thought about this so much. There are too many parallels to draw, but uh, there's also in sacred geometry, there's something called isometric, isomorphic uh, shapes. So there are those are four in number also, and uh, these four columns are shaped like those. There's a triangle, a circle, a hexagon, and a square. The square represents Kali because um, it also represents earth and grounding. The circle uh, represents um, Lakshmi, who also represents harmony. And um, the triangle is Saraswati, and the hexagon is Maheshwari. Six is a really special number, even if you look at it from a numeral numerological perspective. Also, an interesting thing about hexagons is that um, why did bees choose hexagons to like make their homes? Because if you draw circles next to each other, there'll be empty gaps, wasted space. But if you draw hexagons, there's no wasted space. It all fits in perfectly together. So there's just so much that can be said about this. I would rather not <laughs> get into it. Uh, maybe after the session also when the conversation is going to go on. So, uh, I have one question for both Prithidi and Manoj. Uh, since you both, I mean, you as an artist and uh, you as someone who works with youth, it's a question concerning our current education in India, which totally misses out on this development of aesthetic sense and appreciation of art. I mean, we are so focused on utilitarianism and education for success uh, kind of a thing. So from your perspective, having worked with youth uh, and from your perspective as an artist, if you would like to share something about uh, what, how, how does, how, what gets missed out when our present mainstream education totally ignores this sense of, uh, this development of sense of beauty and art and artistic appreciation in our students. Maybe whoever wants to start. <laughs> I think today's uh, contemporary contemporary world is uh, uh, witnessing so much of ugliness, ugliness in every aspect of life, emotionally or uh, visually. Those could be smoothed out. If the parents, right from the, you know, from the, the birth of the child, could surround him or her with this sense of beauty, you know, whether in the play things or uh, surrounding the child with, uh, you know, visually all the beautiful things, then uh, making him accustomed to good music, harmonious music. So that would be an all-round education for the child. And much of the wildness we see in the children, they could be, you know, smoothed out and they grow into beautiful beings. The quality of the physical environment itself plays a very important role in invoking that inner quality. One thing that people notice when they come to Oroville is the physical beauty of the space, the way it is maintained and nurtured. That itself without conveying, without talking about it, it does something to those who come and those who live in that space. So that's an unspoken 
influence that is happening continuously and uh, as a culture to really value beauty and spending time and energy to make it happen fortunately that culture is emerging well in oroville and we are blessed with that presence and second the way we engage with young people where uh, when we remove all the formalities and become simple human beings as friends and connecting deeply at an emotional level at a nourishing nurturing level something beautiful begins to emerge on its own and it finds its expression the sense of harmony even when we encounter the most difficult challenges most difficult situations even ugly situations the way uh, like aishwarya was referring to the way we look at a situation a context or a problem as an opportunity where there is a possibility of light a possibility of a greater harmony when we focus on that we see that there is a natural outcome happening in among the students in terms of picking up and tuning into that without ever having to really talk about it so it's more of uh, honoring that inner divinity that inner presence seeing everyone and everything holding that in our presence and the more we are able to address that and honor that and remember that and offer to that naturally there is a flowering and this is totally lacking in our current mainstream education and uh, we are consciously putting a lot of effort into that space how to really honor that the the psychic being the inner flame the rest are natural flowering natural unfolding without having to detail it out I do not know about you and I'm seeing you and I'm seeing you for the first time. So one of my old time favorites is the one where there are three women, you know? Uh, in my head. Go on, go on. Yeah. Um, and I sort of interpreted it as the child inside of me, the mother and myself. And uh, there are these three women going towards the light and I find that incredibly, incredibly beautiful. So I wanted to know who knew what really inspired the yeah, this is the yeah, this towards the moon. This is also I think you had picked up to speak about yeah. it. And I had it for the longest period of time on my desktop as well. I wanted to know from you like what what went behind uh creatives. Mm. Actually uh It was just, you know, I was still a student at that time and uh, my teacher used to, he used to leave me in the house and then go for his own classes in our school. So I used to just uh, dabble with colors and that day I happened to do this. the three girls going to the moon and this was uh, very much in the air you know mother's uh, conception of a, a new form of art and expression of uh, the future world so when my teacher came back from his class and he saw this he said there she's got it uh, something of this future painting that went above my head but that was 
mother have seen this? Yes. Oh, and she said you got a future painting here. Yeah? No. Uh, it was not related, she just, uh, it was very much in the air, you know, that uh, she, she wanted a new way of expressing beauty. Who knows who was part of that? Huta was, she was so lucky, her whole conception of uh, Savitri, it was executed by mother. She, yes. mother herself said that these are not your paintings, but my paintings. So in a way we are all trying that, you know, to, uh, I mean, before beginning a painting, you just meditate on her and then whatever she gives, you express that on the, on the, what do you say, on the canvas. I don't know, it just came. <laughs> Artist. Right now, I'm having a kind of inner, uh, this kind of thought. What is more important, the growing consciousness of artists or technique? Because technique sometimes not very much in your hope is the, what you want to express. How, how was your journey? How did you do? So you learn technique or how is what is she? Uh, yes, my teacher insisted that. Uh, Look, most of these artists, like uh, my favorite was Leonardo, Michelangelo, classical then classical, classical. And along with that, he exposed me to the Indian painters, the great, uh, I should say, the giants in our Indian uh, Renaissance. Abhinindranath Tagore, then Nandalal Bosch, and he used to always point out, look at the gracefulness in their figures. It's not more of the, you know, the uh, physical, uh, how should I say, the perfection. But they have a rhythm in their body, which is uh, again, uh, how should I say, uh, um, what we inherited from the from our Ajanta and uh, Ajanta uh, uh, guess. And uh, so it was a very beautiful uh, training for me, combination of the, the Western art and the Indian art. I've taken lots from the Indian artists in their wash technique and plenty of it from the uh, Western figures. So I've been very happy with this you know, the combination of both of them. Actually, most of my paintings are based on the on lines from Savitri. So, at times, you know, the the pictures just flash, and I don't know from where they've come. Then, when I have uh, finished it, I get as I go through Savitri, I say, I, I say, well, this is what I try to express, and I paint. First you paint and then you try to uh, see something. Yes. Or else uh, there are, when you read and try to put them in there, it becomes more mentalized, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So I just leave it at that. And then I listen to Sunilda's music. I'm very fond of Sunilda's music, and many of my paintings have been inspired by his music. Mm -hmm. Other place came highly his music. Yes. Came from very nice music. Yeah. After the centenary music, after he had composed that music in 72, mother had told him, 
फाइव टाइम्स थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू um just as a maybe a last remark i remembered i think you or somebody mentioned about how we arrange chapels and you know like beauty and harmony can be even expressed through that and i think recently you had shared some picture about you had shared some picture about the uh, swadharma day man and day five and how the naturally the chapel <laughs> people let out how they got arranged and the difference was remarkable i saw it on facebook or Uh, on the social media so that was a very interesting way to capture you know how naturally it outflows that sense of harmony if something inner gets uh, sort of what it wants really it, it was just wonderful that capturing the whole thing so thank you all of you for uh, thank you thank you thank you for <laughs> this wonderful session and really the harmony of the way thoughts flow from one to another was remarkable so thanks for this experience and thank you all for coming to this session